All right. Good, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is Plumbing the Internet, and we're going to be talking about um, BGP, automation, and BSD, obviously, because that's why we're all here. <clears throat> so first of all, I'm curious who knows what in the room? Uh, who's worked with BGP before? How about BGP on BSD? How about automation? Hopefully everyone in the room. How about with Ansible? Awesome. So we can skip through some of the some of the boring parts then, I hope. <clears throat> and I'm going to be cruising along here at a high rate of speed, so if I, if I lose you, by all means, flag me down. So before we get going here, uh, my name's Thomas Johnson. I don't do many slideshows, so it's a little rough around the edges. <clears throat> and how I got to be here, I got started with BSD in 2010. Uh, in 2013, we started planning for a high availability disaster recovery solution and decided that that was going to uh, necessitate us figuring out BGP. So I bought a book and started reading, and uh, early 2014, we turned up our primary site for BGP. Uh, we turned up DR site a couple months later, uh, and then 2015, we got started with Ansible. Uh, and then early 2018, we had our first production test of our DR site because this is the parking lot of our primary data center the week before the Super Bowl. And we decided that we didn't really want to have our production there. <laughs> but, but it wasn't all bad, because when you get your poop in a group and, and actually use your DR facility, then you get away with stuff like this. So I'm going to start here by talking a little bit about Ansible. Um, and since part of the presentation here is to demonstrate what you can do with, with automating your BGP with Ansible, it seemed like a, great, a really great and probably really foolish thing to build the demonstration lab as we go here. So we'll be turning that loose in a couple minutes. Um, but real quick, a couple of things about Ansible that are worth noting. Uh, it's written in Python. It's idempotent operations, so much like Puppet or, or the other uh, automation systems, you're telling Ansible how you want things to be, not necessarily what you want them to be doing. Um, it's, a, it's a very thin layer, so your client nodes don't really need much in the way of uh, prerequisites other than stuff that you're probably already running in your network anyways. Uh, as far as requirements, like I said, there's not a whole lot. You need to install Ansible on your master nodes, and then your client nodes are going to need uh, SSH, Python, stuff that we already have installed. So you can be up and running without you know, going to great lengths. I'm going to start, jump right into some of the configuration of Ansible here. And we're going to start with inventory, which is the component of Ansible where we, we tell Ansible everything that we wanted to know about our network and the, everything that we wanted to know about our network. And the, at the heart of that is the hosts file, uh, which is where we define all of the hosts that we want Ansible to know about. Uh, and we can also organize, th organize those into groups to simplify configuration. We can run, run Ansible plays against a group of hosts. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, we've got, we've got a group called Beehive Guests, and we've got a bunch of uh, guests that are, are listed underneath that. The right-hand side is a variation on a theme. It's a group cons composed of groups. So we're, we're aggregating a bunch of subgroups into one group. Makes it really handy to share configuration amongst other things. Uh, moving deeper into the inventory, uh, we get into the host fars and group fars files. And this is, this is where we really kind of get into the heart of what inventory is all about. Uh, it's a freeform YAML file. Uh, Ansible doesn't really put much in the way of restrictions on how you can format data that you're putting into, into this file. Um, in fact, pretty much everything on the, on the left-hand side, which is a host vars file, is completely arbitrary. You know, it's, it's put together the way that, that I want to use it in my implementation. So this is a host vars file. A um, couple of things that are worth noting here. I can even use my laser pointer. We're defining our host configuration path where we want Ansible to go and look for configuration files if it ne needs them. Uh, and then down below, we're starting to uh, 
starting to describe how we want Ansible to structure the network build for this particular host. <clears throat> and the nice thing about that is it's, you know, we're defining it all in one single file or a group of files not spread out over, over a whole mess of files. On the right-hand side, we've got an example of a group vars file, um, which there again, it's configuration that applies to an entire, entire group, and it brings up a BSD gotcha, which is that Ansible uses user bin Python as its default path for the Python interpreter. So unless you've somehow got that in your BSD implementation, you're going to need to update that. And at this point, we have enough configuration in Ansible that we can actually start doing things. The, the other piece to Ansible that's just as important as inventory is going to be playbooks. And playbooks are really the, the top level unit of how we, how we do things in Ansible. A playbook's nothing more than a text file. Uh, again, it's written, written largely in YAML, or entirely in YAML. Uh, com compose, it's composed of one or more plays that's run against a, a host or a group of hosts. Uh, and within that play, we have uh, one or more, zero or more, tasks that are actually applied to that host, or the host in the play. So we have an, another example here. Uh, can everyone read the small text? OK. If, if you can't read things in the back, let me know, and I'll, I'll do what I can to make them bigger, especially when I start pulling up terminals. Uh, but this is an example play. Uh, we're running this play against the Beehive Guests group. Uh, and then we've got a couple of tasks that are listed here where basically we're just checking a couple variables that are defined and we're, we're statting a path and doing nothing more than that at this point. The other interesting part of Ansible, uh, it's similar to other systems, is there's a concept of roles, which is basically just a predefined structure to, um, for code reuse. So if you have a piece of a, a group of tasks that, that are self-contained and you want to be able to use all over the place, Roles are the way to do it. Uh, they have a predefined uh, directory structure, which is what we see on the right-hand side here. And we've got directories for tasks, for default variables, uh, handlers. Uh, we can even include other roles from, from a single role. So there's a lot of flexibility there. The other thing I'll, I'll point out here before we go too much further is VM Beehive, which is a tool that I found on GitHub when I was looking for something to, something I could use to avoid having to figure out all of the Beehive provisioning by hand. And it's basically just a light uh, CLI interface front end to, to Beehive, lets you do all of your network configuration <laughs> automatically. And the question is, as Baptiste pointed out earlier, is why doesn't FreeBSD have something like this in base already? So at this point, a little bit about the, the demo that we're going to be, that I'm going to be building up here. Um, it's really s essentially starting with nothing more than a, a Beehive host, and we've got an Ansible guest running on that, on that host. Uh, and from that, we've got, uh, on the host, we have a pre-built stem cell of a, a Zvol, and all of our guests are going to be cloned from that and then bootstrapped as necessary to build our network. And so once we get this going, about 17 minutes later from that, those first two, two hosts, we end up with, should end up with a fully routed network. And if you guys saw the GitHub li links at the beginning of the presentation and pull, it, pull the, the diagram that I forgot to mention that you should pull up, then you already have a copy of this in front of you. <clears throat> so real quick here, a, a high level view of what the, the bootstrap process looks like for these these routers. Uh, the first thing that we're doing, you can see we're doing a ZFS clone to clone the stem cell into the, the host name that we want. Uh, then we import that, that volume so that we can do our bootstrap operations on it. We call a couple of very minimal roles that are going to build up the basic configuration that we need for this host to run, which really amounts to building out the config files for the routing daemon and templating rc.conf. And really, there's nothing more than that, and, and we're going to end up with a, a working router. At that point, we export the zvol and boot the guest. And this is my reminder to go and actually start the playbook. 
So we'll flip over here, and can everybody see this? Well enough anyways? Good. So uh, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the ANSI, ANSI playbook command, 001 build demo is just a, a real lightweight playbook that calls a role that does the bootstrapping of, of the entire network. And we're skipping a tag here for some slow tasks that we don't really need to run because they take even longer. And, and we'll set it loose. And the first thing that it's, it's doing here is something I didn't mention. It's going through and it's doing some initial checks of the Beehive host to make sure that uh, the bridges and, and such that we're going to need for, for all of the guests are in place and ready to, ready to go. So while that's running, I'm going to flip back and start talking about BGP. And we'll start by talking about what the Internet is. <clears throat> the Internet, as, as I'm sure many of us are aware, is just a, a handful of autonomous systems that need to communicate with each other. And the way that everybody communicates with each other, for better or for worse, is using BGP. Uh, now you guys can read Wikipedia just as well as I can regurgitate it, probably better. So I'm just going to point out a couple of things on BGP that are, are worth noting here. Uh, it's a distance vector protocol. It measures the shortest AS path uh, between two autonomous systems, um, which basically means we're, we're doing path determination based on the number of organizations that our, our traffic is going to be passing through. Uh, there's two varieties of BGP. There's an in external and an internal variety. The external variety is used to pass routing information between organizations. Uh, the internal variety is used to pass that information amongst uh, internal BG sp BGP speakers within an organization. Uh, the one gotcha here is that generally you still need a secondary, uh, you need an interior protocol to discover your own internal network, uh, generally BGP doesn't handle that for you. So in this case, we'll be using OSPF, but any sort of interior protocol works. So we're going to do BGP. What do we need? Well, the first thing we need is money, but fortunately, we don't need a whole heck of a lot of it to get started, uh, especially if you're a, s a smaller organization. Uh, we're going to need uh, numbers. We're going to need an AS number. We need IP addresses. We're going to need routers, and we're going to need connectivity. And for those last two points, we're going to want more than one. If you're going to go to the time and, time and trouble of deploying BGP, there's, there's no point in deploying it on just a single, single router, single connection. You're wasting your time. <clears throat> Internet registries are the place to go to get number resources. Um, if you're in the United States or Canada, you're going to be talking to Aaron. Uh, that's where my experience is. Uh, your mileage may vary if you're from outside of that region, but these are the folks that you need to go talk to. Uh, the one thing that I will mention is that if you start down this process of getting numbering resources and you have questions, um, speaking in the context of Aaron, Aaron is your friend. Uh, they're not a gatekeeper. They're not the bad guy. They're there. Their mission is to help you get resources to do things on the Internet. And so... They're, they're generally willing to go well out of their way to, to help you out. Autonomous system numbers simply is a number that identifies your organization. There's two-byte and four-byte varieties. Two-byte vari are the legacy variety. Uh, I don't even know if they're issuing two-byte AS numbers anymore. Uh, do. do they? Okay. Who are you with? Okay. 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 I, I have a two-byte number because I was because we were in early enough. <clears throat> so thanks for the clarification. Uh, IPv6. You get addresses from your registrar. Your allocation is going to depend on your on your organization size. Um, and the one thing that I'll I'll point out here, well, two things I'll point out here. Minimum announcement size that's going to be accepted generally is going to be a slash forty-eight. And as you start to work out your addressing scheme, I really recommend not, not allocating anything less than a slash 64. Even if you deploy a smaller subnet, allocate a slash 64. IPv4 is the legacy protocol on the internet. Everyone in this room knows about it. It's exhausted. The minimum announcement size is a slash 24. 
think there's enough said there. As far as obtaining resources, you, you can, and I'm going to get to that. But I like that picture. So blocks can be had. The internet registries have waiting lists. Uh, there's a transfer market that you can take your chances on if you're so inclined. But there's another trick. At least for Aaron, there's the 410 rule, uh, which refers to the, the section in their numbering policy. It's a slash 10 that's set aside for IPv6 transition. And the, the, the bottom line here, the big takeaway here, is that if you already have an IPv6 allocation and you want to dual stack your application, you have justification to request a v4 block. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Does Ripe still have a, a pool of blocks, I assume? Okay. Good to know. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Connectivity, real quick. Uh, there's generally three, three methods of obtaining connectivity. Uh, you can either by transit, which means you're paying somebody else to provide you a path to the, f the larger internet. Uh, internet exchange points are a really great way to exchange traffic with geologically local peers. Um, they're also a great source of information. Uh, and then there's peering relationships, where you're exchanging routes with, with another single organization. A couple of connectivity gotchas, real quick, uh, if you're starting to deploy BGP and, and, and bring up transit and things like that, you should, be, you should expect to be providing a letter of, or letter of agency, excuse me. Um, basically acknowledging that, that you are authorized to announce the blocks that you say that you want to announce. Uh, expect that you're going to pay cross-connect fees if you're in a data center or co-location. Um, and uh, the, the last point there, you, you may want to at least uh, make some effort to make sure that your, your fancy redundant fiber isn't running through the same conduit, because that can cause problems, too. <laughs> so switching back to FreeBSD here, um, we'll talk about what we need to turn our FreeBSD into a router. And in a nutshell, you're looking at it. Uh, pretty much everything we, we need at a high level is, is done through rc.conf. Uh, what we're looking at here, we're defining our network interfaces. Uh, we're enabling routing, and we're enabling our routing daemon. And, and there's really not too much more than that. In, in reality, um, things like VLAN, CARP, lag bundles are going to make this more complicated, but we all know that's going to happen anyway. Uh, real quick on firewalling. <coughs> uh, firewalling, generally, I try to separate the filtering and the routing functionality roles on different machines, but there are cases where it's, it's useful to do filtering on your firewall. Uh, the one thing to be aware of is keeping state on connections. Uh, when, if, you move to a, if you're moving to a BGP model where you've got multiple routers and uplinks, it's entirely likely and probable that traffic's going to come, come in one direction and go out another direction. And if we're keeping state for that, you're going to have all sorts of hard to diagnose problems and you'll lose hair and just don't do it. So moving on to our routing daemon. Uh, the routing daemon I'm using here is BIRD. Uh, it's open source. It's pretty widely, widely used. A couple of highlights on it. There's two, two versions that are current. Uh, we're going to be talking about version 1.6. That supports most of the common protocols that you're gonna, going to run into. It's dual stacked. Uh, the, the configuration structure is, is simple and easy to get your head around. Uh, and it has a utility called Bird C, which is very useful for uh, controlling your routing instance and then monitoring it as well. So as we start to look back at, our, at, at the test network here, uh, we're going to take a look at some of these different relationships that, that we're, we're creating with Bird. And so we're looking at a, a portion of the test network here, uh, and we're going to be looking at it largely in the context of this AS123 router 1A. So 
So our first relationship here is our relationship to another AS, and that's going to be where we're using EVGP Within the AS, we have multiple BGP speakers, uh, and this is where we're going to be using IBGP to, to share and communicate that external routing data to all of the different border routers on the, on the network. Internal to the network, we're using OSPF, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to discover all of the routes that are available internally. And then, additionally, we're using a couple of uh, static protocols uh, largely to, as a means of injecting routes into BGP. So rather than, especially from the point of view of an end user, rather than, than blindly redistributing things into BGP, we want to be very sure we know what we're, we're injecting into the, the global internet. <clears throat> so with, with that in mind, we'll take a look at how these relationships actually manifest themselves on a running bird. And so at this point, I've been moving too quick and the network isn't totally up yet. <laughs> but hopefully it is up enough here <clears throat> that we can at least take a look at a couple of, couple of things that are going on in bird. And these are a couple of the commands that I use most frequently just to get a, an idea of what's going on. <clears throat> so show protocols is going to give you a, a quick bird's eye view of all the different protocol instances that are running on your, on your bird and what the status of them are. If you want to dig into a particular protocol instance uh, and see more details about it, we can do that. And this one fortunately has come up, so we can talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> so this is, our, this is our eBGP instance from this router out to its, its upstream neighbor. Um, and we can see that the protocol is up. Uh, the, the interesting thing, the, usually the first thing that I go to look at um, when I'm pulling protocol is to see how many, how many routes are being imported from this, from this peer, how many we're exporting, <clears throat> which, is, which should correspond to just the static routes that we're injecting manually. And then there's a preferred counter here. This is how many routes that we're actually preferring this, this path for. Uh, BirdC is also a, an interactive shell, if I can spell it correctly, which is actually probably even more useful because it has inline help. Um, so we can do th whatever we want from here, like tell Bird to reload its configuration if we've made some configuration changes to it. Uh, but generally, we don't have to do that because we're, we're running everything through Ansible right now, and Ansible is going to handle that for us. <coughs> so. Moving along here, we didn't look at the bird configuration, which is why I put this slide in here so I won't forget about it. <clears throat> so this is the, the actual configuration that's driving what's going on on this router. So looking at the left-hand side here, a lot of what we see at the, at the very top is, is boiler, boilerplate definition. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it here. Uh, the more interesting bits are as we get down into OSPF, we can see that we've defined uh, interfaces for each of the OSPF, each of the interfaces we want to run OSPF on. Uh, some of them are running normal OSPF, some of them are just stub interfaces. Uh, in particular, our, our uplink interfaces we don't want to run OSPF on. Uh, you can see a couple of static instances defined here. Uh, for static BGP, portable BGP, this is where we're defining the routes we want to inject into BGP. Um, and the, the distinction between the two is more applicable in a, in a multi-site configuration. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we see our definitions for our eBGP and I, IBGP sessions. Um, and they look pretty bare here. Uh, we're really just de defining what our neighbor is. And the reason that they look so bare is because we're templating them. So these configurations are templated by an included file, which I forgot to point out at the top of the file where we plug all of our common configuration that's going to be the same for all of our BGP and eBGP instances on this router. We just plug it into a single template, and then we can reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. And the, the, there's not a whole lot more that we're, we're defining here. We're defining our AS number. Uh, we are defining a, a little bit of a hack here uh, to allow our, 
our own AS number to appear in the AS path. Uh, th this is not generally allowed by BGP uh, to prevent loops. Um, but it is useful if you're running multi-site configuration, you don't have a point-to-point -point link. Um, if we want to route between the two sites, we have to be able to allow the AS number. So looking at the bottom of this file here, it's kind of cut off here, but uh, the IBGP template is largely, largely the same as EBGP with just a couple of changes. So now that we've looked at the bird configuration, we'll look at the, the actual template that that configuration file is, is generated from. And we're doing that with, with Ansible. Ansible uses the Jinja templating language uh, for all of its templating plays. Uh, uses it for the playbooks and configuration as well. Um, and it's, it's very flexible. It draws information in from inventory, which is why we're finding it all there. And it's basically what allows me to generate 15 routers in this demonstration from what amounts to about one set of configurations. Oops, jumped ahead. <clears throat> so we will take a look at these templates. And so first we'll look back at the, the inventory a little bit here. And this is the inventory, again, for router 1A. Uh, we've got, again, some boilerplate at the top that's, that's less interesting. Uh, but as we get down here into the network configuration, again, this is all arbitrary. You can structure it in whatever way makes sense to you. Uh, but we're defining the addressing for each of our interfaces. Uh, we're defining what, the inter what interface name it should be associated with. Uh, in the case of some interfaces, we're defining CARP addresses if we want to do high availability there. We're defining what the OSPF relationship is. And then as we move down into the bird section of this dictionary, uh, we're starting to see all of our, our routing related configuration, like what our AS number is. Um, we've got a section here that's, that's defining what prefixes we're going to be uh, putting into the static and portable protocols. And if you look here, we've got additional variables that are being pulled in using the double braces. Um, which basically just means that I'm, I'm defining what these, these lists are elsewhere in the configuration, actually in group FARS files, because they're common across AS123. And then I'm pulling them in here. At the bottom of the file, we see the definitions for our BGP sessions. And again, because everything's very templated, there's really not a whole lot that we need to define here. Looking over here on the right side, we're actually looking at the bird.conf file that's before it's templated by Ansible. Um, so again, here we see, we see double braces, which indicate that we're doing a variable substitution, bringing something in from inventory, and plugging it into the file. Um, there we go. The OSPF section here. We're starting to see some logic being used. We're starting to see a for loop where it's looping through all of the, infant, the interfaces that are defined in inventory, looking to see if it should be configured for OSPF. Uh, again, we're doing looping to define the, the static protocols, uh, basically taking everything that's in a list, of, a list in inventory and plugging it into the static protocol. And then at the bottom here, we have another couple of sections, again, to define our BGP instances. Find my slideshow and check to see if indeed our playbook finished, and it did. And so at this point, our, our network should be fully routable, fully built and routing. And now that that's done, let's break it. So what I'm going to do is run a, create a couple of failures within the network, and we can watch and see how BGP responds to those. I'm also going to demonstrate a couple of, couple of useful management functions that, you, that are pretty easily implemented using Ansible. So the first thing that we're going to do is talk about link failures, because they happen. So looking again here, a lot of this is going to be in the context of 
these bottom two clouds here, which are both AS123, they're just two different sites. Think of it as a primary site, DR site, backup site, what have you. So in our first case, we're gonna, we're gonna look at what happens to traffic flowing between the two sites if we, if we happen to just fail a link. So under normal operations, traffic going from site A over to site B is gonna take the shortest path through AS100, AS300, and then back into the other site. Once this link goes down, obviously we want BGP to figure it out and just do the right thing and use its other available uplink through AS200, 100, 300, and life is good. So if we flip over to my other consoles that are running, we've got a couple of things going on here. We've got, we've got a connection into router 1A and we're just watching the, the debug output coming from that daemon. <clears throat> we have a trace route running from the firewall that's at site A to the firewall that's at site B. So nothing particularly fancy there. And this is a case where we can use Ansible. We can use the Ansible command to run a one-off command against anything that's in inventory. So in this case, we're gonna tell the AS100 router that we wanted to shut down its VTNet2 link. So it's gonna connect and do that and success and we start to see packet loss on our trace route. And then within a couple seconds here, Ansel, or BGP is going to pick up on the fact that it can't talk to its neighbor anymore, readjust its routing table. And if we restart the trace, trace route, we see that we're, we're still communicating we're just communicating over a slightly different path. The next thing we'll talk about here is site failover. And this is useful if you're running production services from one site and you wanna pick those services up and start running them from your backup site uh, without having to, to monkey with DNS and, and, and other resort to other tricks like that. So the process to do this is actually really simple. And if we look at the Ansible configuration here, it, it's really just driven by the, it's just a reuse of the, the roles and playbooks that we've already defined for bootstrapping the routers. Um, if we look over an in inventory, uh, we're looking at a couple of group var files uh, for AS123 on, on the left-hand side here. And the top pane is is just for the site A routers, and we're defining that our location is A. Down below, for the entire AS, we're just finding that the, the active location is also A. So really, the, the process of doing the failover is just running a playbook and telling, telling Ansible, passing in a variable that says, you, you should reformat everything so that site B becomes active, and then reload the Ansible, con or reload the bird configs, and we'll be active at the new site in, in no time flat or something approximately that. In reality, the, the failover is actually pretty quick on the order of, of a couple of seconds. So looking back at our windows here, starting from what is actually our, our Ansible host, I'm gonna start a trace route into www.as123, which is not going to work for me. <clears throat> but that will. So we've got a trace route running, and so what the network looks like here. Ah, I knew I had another slide here. So looking again at our network, we have our Ansible host way up here, which is currently routing into our portable address space, which didn't make it on the diagram, but it's just another slash 24 and another slash 48 that we're announcing from whatever site is active. <clears throat> so it's, it's routing into site A to those portable addresses. So what we want to do is pick those addresses up, and rather than bring them in here, we want to bring them in 
over here to site B. And so to do that, we have a pre-cooked playbook that here again, we all, all we need to do is fire it up. And so looking at this playbook invocation, <clears throat> if we open up the playbook, there's really, there's really nothing going on there other than Oh, I was going to talk about that, and then I didn't. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the extent of the playbook that's going to, to handle this failover. And the most interesting bits are really these last three tasks, where we, or our last four tasks here, where we template our bird configuration files by calling the bird configuration role. We actually go and update the Ansible inventory once we've made the change, so the change is persistent within this system and then we reload the bird configuration. And then we make noise warning you that you've, you've done something that you should probably be aware of. <clears throat> so looking at the playbook invocation, we've got our playbook name and we're specifying a couple of additional variables on the command line. We're telling it that its new active location should be B and that once it's done doing what it wants to do, that it should reconfigure the bird instances and activate the changes. So as that runs here, there, there is one, one sanity check in the playbook where it pauses and, and, and has you confirm that yes, indeed, you're sure that you want to move your services to the other site. And yes, we're sure. So it's going to go and configure its bird files. updates the inventory, reloads the bird configuration. We, we see the, the debugs start to update the pathing. And then if we look back at this trace route, rather than going into site, site A, we now see that it's starting to go into site B on its way into that portable service. So the next thing we'll, we'll talk about in terms of management is what happens if we want to deprioritize a router. If we want to bring a router down for maintenance uh, or we're having trouble with our upstream provider, we just want to keep as much traffic off of that router as possible to reduce the disruption. Uh, deprioritizing it is the way to go. So coming back to our trusty network diagram, we already have a, a link failure. And currently our traffic between sites is coming in through AS300. But what happens if we want to bring this, this router down, perform maintenance on it while we're failed over to our DR site, which may be getting a little bit contrived, but it could happen. So the way that we do that again is by leveraging the, the Ansible roles that we already have defined, and here again just passing them a couple of different variables so that they, they manipulate the bird configuration files a little bit differently. And I have an example of that right here. What we're looking at here is the uh, bird BGP include file uh, that's templated out by Ansible. And the couple of parts that are, are most interesting here is based on, based on a variable definition, we're changing the preference of the BGP protocols for this router down from the default 100 down to 99 so that any routes that come in over this protocol instance are going to be, are, are going to be skipped in, in the presence of a better route. Uh, down below here, we've got an export filter for routes that are being sent out of this BGP instance, and we are going to do BGP path prepending, which basically amounts to inserting our own AS a number of additional times into the AS path before we send it to our upstream router. Uh, basically makes the path look artificially long and is going to cause the rest of the internet to go, well, I've got a better path over there. I'm not going to send any traffic to this router. So here again, it's, it's just a case of, of running another playbook. Where once again, we have a couple of variables defined. Um, Cute names aside, 
we're telling Ansible that we indeed want to that we indeed want to deprioritize the router. We're telling it which router that we want to deprioritize, which in this case is 2B. And we're telling it, again, that we want it to configure the bird changes automatically. And the, the configure bird variable is just another sanity check that I like to use uh, for cases where I may want to stage configurations but not necessarily activate them right away. But in this case, we do. So if we look back at our trace route that's running between sites, we can see, we can see that here again it's running through AS 200, 100, 300, and back into our other site. Once we run this playbook, this route is going to become a heck of a lot less attractive. So what BGP is actually going to do is it's going to say, well, this, this is a really long route, but I've got this shorter route by going up and around through AS50 and back into our other uplink. So with that, we'll see if it does what it's supposed to. Here again, it's, it's templating bird configurations. And there's, there's no changes being made to the main bird configurations. It's all happening in the included files. We reconfigure bird. We start to see changes immediately on our other router. And our, our route changes. And if we reset that trace route, we see that we, have, we still have connectivity just over a much longer path. forgot all of my other things that I already talked about. So the very last thing that we're going to talk about is what happens if we cause some more mischief. Because failing a link wasn't fun enough, what happens if we blow up a router? So we have our link down, we have our deprioritized router, but what's going to happen if we take out a router somewhere in AS50? And the, the answer here is that even though this, this router is deprioritized, it's still a route into our network that we'll use if we don't have any other option. So looking again, we still have our trace route running, still have our log output. If we flip over to our Beehive host, we can tell Beehive to just power off the host. And we immediately start seeing packet loss on our, on our path. And once again, once BGP figures out that there's a problem, starts to reconfigure itself, then the network comes back to life. And we can see that once again, it is taking that, what is actually a shorter path through 200, 100, and 300. And life goes on. Your, your pager goes off, you say everything's good, and you go back to bed. And with that, that is what I have. So I'm interested for any questions that you may have. What's the latency look like for using Ansible to cut over changes configurations to switch which ones be active? Because for us, with Puppet, Puppet's a bit too slow to do switching between an A and a B. Mm -hmm. For our things like our CARF IPs, if we want to do the cut over, we have a bunch of shell scripts that we can both promote and we can make some changes very rapidly. Right, between sites or between between routers? Uh, well, between web servers inside the site. Okay. Um, Ansible, I don't know that I would use it for failing over servers or clusters, things like that, um, because it, it is slow. Um, uh, CARP is a lot faster. Um, so actually, for cases, I didn't really talk about it on the, in the slideshow anywhere here. Um, but be, between our two border routers, uh, we've got our, our routers, we've got a firewall or a cluster firewall sitting behind it. I'm actually using CARP on the border routers so that that firewall can just set a default gateway. It doesn't actually have to run BGP. And so then if a, if a router fails within a second, we're, we're back up and running and life is good. Anybody else? Are you using Ansible on your routers? Yes. Did you also try to implement it to actual hardware routers or just uh, previous devices? 
um, we're in production, we're running FreeBSD physical hardware. Um, the Ansible does have, a, they've been putting a lot of effort into um, building out modules uh, for controlling various network hardware. Uh, so at this point, there's, there's support for Cisco, Juniper. Back to what? Bash scripts. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that one. <clears throat> but um, I, I'm, not using, I'm not using Ansible to control any, any vendor hardware. Um, I haven't had a use case. My FreeBSD boxes work great for BGP, and my switching doesn't change enough for, for me to have a, a good reason to, to integrate Ansible with it. Yeah, if I can if I can pull it up here real quick. Ansible has a huge library of, of modules that are are provided by core. Um, if you look in the It has. Yeah, I think the the acquisition by Red Hat does has really put some pressure under them to support a lot of enterprise products, which is a good thing. So VMware support, uh, AWS support has gotten huge. So there's just a ton of flexibility that you don't have to reinvent. And additionally, there, there's Ansible Galaxy, which is uh, a repository of pre-built roles and, and other reusable code that other people have submitted that, that, that's useful as well. If you can read it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm using exactly one one module from from Galaxy. Did you have a question? Uh, how do you mitigate the problem of client side Ansible vulnerabilities? Like uh, if some work gets compromised and exploits the controller somehow uh, to get access to more machines, how is there any uh, way you can uh, isolate so that maybe a single controller is only responsible for a single host in your network? Or how do you address that? Ansible has a lot of built in protection against them. There have been a number of vulnerabilities that have been had been figured out surrounding that and escaping, quoting, uh, things like that. Um, and Ansible is actually pretty good about uh, warning you when you're when you're doing something, when you're doing something you shouldn't be, you know, such as you know, trusting client input that you that you shouldn't be. Yeah, it was an Ansible client problem actually. You connected to some host and uh, just by uh, injecting some commands, it was able to compromise the, the controller that was. Uh, in the commands, I think that's a terrible scenario in this case. So yeah. It's always, this is the way. Yeah, that's, um, you know, it's, it's, always a, it's always a possibility and a concern. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Right. If you're in the cloud, you're free. Right. Anybody else? It should be on private subnet. Is there Yes, it should be. <laughs> Protect your controller, I think, is the bottom line.
Well, if nobody else has anything, I'd like to thank you for coming.